So as I was saying, <laughs> it's nice to be back. Is my mic on? I can't tell. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Um, let me let's just catch up a little. Um, I was I left here uh, January 2015 which in some ways seems like yesterday, in other ways I realize has been like 38 months. And um, I'm not gonna tell you everything that's happened. If you're on Facebook, you already know. But uh, Dorian and I are living in France, in Lyon, and she didn't make this trip uh, because being Dorian, she's joined two orchestras that she's performing as a violinist with, one in Lyon and one that's preparing to do uh, a tour of Vienna in uh, the summer and she's got client you know consulting clients there and so forth and we're looking to buy an apartment in Lyon we just has kind of fallen in love with that city so so that's what's going on and in the interim we've been in about 25 countries and 18 states and um, what I've discovered is that there are conscious people all over the place you know I used to think they were only here <laughs> That when you got outside of these walls, you know, everybody was like, you know, off their rocker or something like that or, or not spiritually awake or whatever the case may be. And one of the most interesting places we were was uh, we, both this past winter and the winter before we spent some time in Miami at a place called Rome. It's R-O-A-M. And it's a uh, co-living, co-working space where, you know, you've seen co-working space where you can have an office and all that or a desk. And this adds like sleeping suites and we spent four months there uh, last winter and um, met mostly the people staying there are millennials who are digital nomads of one kind or another they can work from anywhere their you know w their work is done online they're their marketing internet marketers they one fellow buys and sells internet companies and there were artists there and musicians and these some of the most conscious people I've run into in a long time mostly in their 20s, maybe to mid-30s. And um, they meditated, and they did yoga, and they uh, wanted to connect and have great conversations, and, and they, they really see the world of work as the place to create social change. Really an interesting group of people. And now in Europe, I'm connecting, connecting with uh, the European integral community, which is, uh, some of you are familiar with Ken Wilber's work, the philosopher, and, there's an integral movement in this country and there's one in Europe and I'm going to be speaking at their conference in Budapest in June. And um, just some amazing people and, and Europeans in general. Um, I'm just going to say this. They seem to be a little more awake. Not a whole lot. <laughs> a little more awake. It's not like a huge difference, but it's palpable. It's palpable. It's palpable in the way they talk about government. It's palpable in the way uh, the expectations they have. For example, uh, my cell phone, which this is my American cell phone. I have a European cell phone too. It looks just like this. And um, <laughs> it's actually the same, an iPhone 7. And um, it costs me 49 euros a month, which is about $56 a month. And that's unlimited everything. Because the requirement in the European Union is a communication company's primary thing is to serve the customer. And profit has to be secondary. So if the same company we have our cell phone with, when we buy a place, we'll get our cable TV with. And the full cable package with all the bells and whistles is 99 euros. And that includes high-speed internet and everything else. You see, so there's a, that's a, there's a consciousness behind those kinds of policies that is uh, somewhat different than, than we have evolved here. We have evolved here that the companies that sell us our services are responsible first to their shareholders and secondarily to the customers, maybe not even secondarily. Um, we see the same thing in healthcare. You know, I, I, we've had to use healthcare over there a couple times. Once I had to go to the emergency room because I was injured by a wine glass. <coughs> True story, um, and I lacerated, actually it was this hand, I lacerated this hand washing the glass and it broke and I cut my hand and went to the ER and got attended to 
and then I was given a follow-up appointment in three days and went back in three days and and they you know cleaned it up and, and bandaged it again and so forth and the bill for both visits total was 83 euros that was an emergency two emergency room visits with an emergency room doctor and two nurses okay so we have insurance to cover us over there and it costs eighteen hundred dollars for both of us for the full year for our unlimited health insurance including five hundred thousand dollars in uh, air ambulance service back to the u.s should we need it because the insurance companies know how little they're going to have to pay out if we do use the health care over there you see so um, i don't want to get into a health care debate but i don't know anyone in this country that's happy with their health care and I don't know anyone in Europe that really isn't happy with their health care. Okay, we know one person. Okay. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad you are. You must be healthy. <laughs> so what I've been doing since, since we last, well, not since we last talked, but since I, I left here, um, aside from traveling, is... You know, I've been really looking at how can I be uh, engaged in, in ministry, and that includes a couple things. I, Dorianne and I have a coaching program for ministers um, in terms of leadership and things like that, and I do a blog that you may be familiar with called New Thought Evolutionary that I write usually a couple times a week. There's some kind of an entry in that. And then this book, The Beloved Community, uh, actually came out of some entries that were in the blog. Because I notice that there's some, some dynamics that are happening around uh, the world and in, in, in our culture and many other cultures that are affecting things like how people consume spiritual community. You know, it's different than it used to be. Um, if you go back into the 20th century, the way that our centers operated, the way that, uh, that we did church, so to speak, uh, was... Yep, not so much different from the way it's done now. The difference was there were more people here. And that's true. There are only two denominations in the United States that are growing. One is the Baha'i, and they're tiny to begin with, but they are seeing some growth. And the other is Islam. And Islam is growing for two reasons, uh, immigration, and Islam is spreading very quickly in the, in the prison population. About 25% of American Muslims are African American. And the connection is largely through the prison system. Every other denomination is losing membership across the board. And we're not immune from that in New Thought. So I wanted to look at, you know, what, what's going on here. And what I find, I think, when, when you look at the, the studies that have been done, and I, you know, I spend time talking to ministers and, and speaking at events and coming in and working with leadership teams and things like that, I think what's happened is we become attached to the form in which we do things to the, to the extent sometimes that we lose sight of the principles of why we're doing it. So one of the things I try to talk about and work with uh, people is, is be f flexible about form and be firm and solid about your principles. You know, for example, the Sunday go-to-meeting format, which this is, right, there's been some decline in people attending. And if you look at the larger society, there's reasons for that. You know, back in the day, back, you know, 40, 50 years ago, most people had Monday to Friday, nine to five jobs. There was no kids programs or little league or soccer on Sunday, Sunday morning. Stores weren't open. You couldn't buy booze till one o'clock. <laughs> so communion wine was kind of appealing, you know. <laughs> And today, th today, that's quite different. A minority of people work Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. For some people, Sunday is maybe not, even, it's not a day off or it's their only day off. And they have family obligations. And we have, you know, divorced parents where the kids are here one week and then somewhere else the next. So there's, it got, it's gotten more complex. It's gotten more, you know, less of a, it used to be our society carved out a space for that Sunday experience by kind of enforcing that nothing else was going on. And that's gone away. Um, in France, by the way, where I live, church attendance, weekly church attendance is under 1%. It's the most secular nation in Europe. So when you go to church, which we do occasionally, you go into the beautiful churches where the organs are playing, there's like 30 people in a 1,000-seat church and 
28 of them are tourists. <laughs> yeah. Just kind of the way it is over there. Um, we were actually looking at a condo that was in an old church that the church had been converted into condominium spaces. So what kind of attracted me to looking at the beloved community was, is there an idea that we can, we can maybe get behind or understand as our mission that might attract people in whether or not, whatever the form within the community is. We already have centers in our organization that don't meet on Sunday morning. They meet other times or they have smaller groups getting together and there's lots of different forms beginning to emerge and we don't know what's going to work because nobody's been here before. You know, one of my favorite sayings by William Gibson, the author, he says, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. <laughs> so, there are, so there are some places that are kind of on the cutting edge of things, and there are other places that kind of aren't, and the, the rates of change and the, and the pressures and the dynamics are different in different places. It's very different on the coasts of the U.S. than it is in the middle of the country, generally speaking. So, you know, how do, we, how do we look at all that? So Martin Luther King, who was really working from an idea developed by Howard Thurman, talked about the beloved community. And this is a statement, you, you heard the quote that, that uh, Dennis Merritt Jones on stilts read earlier. <laughs> <laughs> from, from my book, I hope Dennis isn't watching. And, um, he will, he'll hear about it, and he will be. Um, so this is a statement from the King Center in Atlanta about the concept of the beloved community. And he said, Dr. King's beloved community is a global vision in which all people can share in the wealth of the earth. In the beloved community, poverty, hunger, and homelessness will not be tolerated because of international, standard, international standards of human decency will not allow it. Racism and all forms of discrimination, bigotry, and prejudice will be replaced by an all-inclusive spirit of sisterhood and brotherhood. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, right? <laughs> now, if you were to give the earth a report, you know, a report card on, on this being the goal for the last semester, uh, we probably wouldn't be getting A's, <laughs> right? We're beginning, there's, but there are some places where things are beginning to happen. There's some waking up happening. You know, there are people realizing that uh, if, if it's to be, it's up to me kind of a thing. The kids at Parkland, for example. The Me Too movement. Um, and things like that, that, you know, seem to be getting more traction than maybe they would have in the past. Okay, at the same time, there's counter forces going on. The, things are kind of uh, screwed up. <laughs> Chaotic. And wherever you stand in terms of your own worldview, that's, you could probably agree with that, and you're just blaming different people for it. <laughs> See? But what Dr. King understood was we need an overarching goal. And what I try to do when I work with ministers or with spiritual communities is try to get, are you locally in alignment with this idea into the point where you're functioning at a high enough level that you can contribute to that idea? Because most spiritual communities of any stripe spend most of their energy on organizational survival. You know, they're worrying about too much month at the end of the money. Right? Can we pay our bills? Can we fix up the building? Can, you know, all those kinds of things that are necessary. But when you have an overarching mission and goal that is really attractive to people, that people want to be engaged in and be a part of, we find that for those organizations that manage to do that, the organizational survival stuff tends to take care of itself. You see, so less energy goes into that and more energy goes into living the principles. And I think for our movement, for the New Thought movement in general, and again, it'll be uneven, but in general, it seems to be a strong desire to engage the world socially in a bigger way. Walking our talk, as opposed to learning principles here and not, be, not doing anything as a, as a community outside in the larger community. There seems to be a pretty clear new thing emerging, and it is new for us, because for many, many years, 
our, our centers, our communities were pretty insular. There were some exceptions, but as a rule, we were pretty, we were, I, I, I kind of envision us all sitting in a circle doing our, doing our spiritual practices together so that we would manifest personally more good things in our lives, which is fine. And now I, but now I think in addition to that, there's now a turning outward to say, how can we help the larger community? How can we engage? And, it, and our teens really kind of led the way with this a number of years ago with the, what was known as the Malawi School Project. You, many of you here, we have the thing on the back wall there about that, where the teens came up with an idea to build schools in, in, in that African country that's one of the poorest on earth and raised the money to build 20 schools and partnered with other nonprofits to, to staff those schools with teachers and books and things like that. We have communities that, that build, uh, dig wells and put wells in communities in, in the third world countries that aren't able to access clean water very easily. <coughs> Dr. David Ald in Atlanta has started a school, two schools now in Cambodia that are funded through his Khmer Children's Foundation that was started in the community of the Spiritual Living Center of Atlanta. So there's more and more of that kind of thing happening. At our conference a couple of weeks ago, many of the speakers talked about social engagement. I'm on a committee for Centers for Spiritual Living called Spiritually Motiv Motivated Social Engagement Committee that is about taking our principles into the world and trying to make good change or positive change based on spiritual principles. So statements go out that Dr. Ken Gordon, you know, under his signature, and, and now we're beginning a process of training local communities on how to engage locally in the issues that are of concern in your area, because they vary from places to pl place to place. And there are people who say, I'm not interested in that. I just want to come here and learn how to make a lot of money and get a good relationship and find my soulmate, and then I'm out of here. <laughs> then they come back when it falls apart, right? And then <laughs> try it again. And that's okay, too. But I don't think that anymore we can survive on that being all we do, whether that's in our intention or not. Are we, be, are we in alignment with our highest intentions? Is always a good question. Am I just complaining about the world or am I doing something to help? You know, the, the essence of our teaching is that every, your power is within you. Yet how often are we blaming other people when things go wrong? If only they change, I'd be happy. That doesn't even work with your kids, <laughs> right? So this quote, I think, is really important. And the picture of Dr. King in handcuffs is intentional here. You know, when Dr. King was shot, he was the most hated man in America. We often look back now with, you know, we mythologize things. But he was the most hated man in America when he was killed. There were many people that were not bothered at all by what happened. So he says, our goal is to create a beloved community, and this will require a qualitative change in our lives as well as a quantitative change in our souls. And by that, he means how we are with one another. How are we being with one another in this building, in our neighborhoods, in our local governments, in our state, in our nation, on our planet? Are we walking our talk? Or are we contributing to the divisiveness? Have we given up? Because you just can't talk to these people, whoever they are, and they're saying the same thing about you, whoever you are. Or can we find a way to maybe make the first attempt or an attempt to bridge those gaps? knowing we're not always going to be successful. See, I can't make my mission contingent on success. Because I don't even know what success is sometimes. And sometimes all I can do now is plant seeds that will come to grow after I've left the scene. I'm getting to that age now. 
I don't expect massive transformation in my lifetime. There's too much work to do. But I do expect to start walking down that path, and hopefully we do it together in larger and larger groups. And it's not just about confronting what we disagree with, it's about learning that sometimes what we disagree with makes perfect sense to the person who's saying it. One of the things we have to understand is you look across the political spectrum in this country and you think, God, they're crazy, and that group's crazy over there, and that group's crazy for a whole different reason, but every one of them to themselves is being internally consistent and logical. We are incapable as human beings of doing anything we can't actually justify within ourselves. So it's not that they're wrong. That's not the, that doesn't work. Have, have, has it worked with you when someone comes up and tells you you're wrong? Do you say, oh, please, tell me more? <laughs> Sometimes we're both right. We both have an aspect of the truth. And we're not going to get, nobody's going to win outright. One point of view doesn't win ultimately. You know, we get five to four Supreme Court decisions that go back and forth depending on who's sitting there. And we treat a five to four decision like a complete victory and then a judge dies and gets replaced and there's another five to four in the other direction. How do we move beyond that? How do we live principle-centered lives and be flexible as to the form that things take? So I'm going to ask my buddy Stephen to come up and we'll talk about this a little bit back and forth. Anything come to mind for you so far? Um, wow. There, there's so much to it. But what, what initially comes to mind is, are you optimistic about where we're going? I'm optimistic about where I'm going. <laughs> yeah, you're going, you're going back to Lyon. Yeah. No, to I be mean assaulted that. by more But I glasses. think that's where it begins. I have to be an optimist about my own life so that I will be able to see the possibilities for other people. Mm -hmm. um, because that's what, what we all want is a good life. See, one of the, th one of the things I'm really clear about is... I put a lot of energy into making my life work, right. which means enjoying what I enjoy, and different people enjoy different things, but I don't think it's all about sacrificing self and saying, I'll, you know, I'll wear sackcloth right. and ashes right. and just go out and sacrifice. I think it's how can we show one another that we can live really good lives, whatever that looks like, and then have those conversations about, okay, what can we, how can we spread this good to a larger group? And I think that, that word is the key to it, because there's so much energy around sacrifice, particularly in old theology that talked about sacrifice. But really, in our teaching, we have this principle that we live by that does allow us to model a way of being mm -hmm. that can put us more in alignment. But I also find really interesting this idea that the person internally is thinking, it's like the fish in water. What is the water, what's water like? So they're actually having that conversation. Where does that shift take place with you when you're having a conversation with someone and you catch it? You catch that they're really in that space. They're totally believing what they're saying and you, and you know there's a growth opportunity there. Have you mm -hmm. found a way to approach that conversation? Well, I do think you know, the term tell me, really, tell me more is, is a good start in many cases because you know you're not gonna like what they have to say maybe. But when we start talking, and I'm, I start looking for any commonality, you know, or I might say, you know, I don't really see it that way, but it's really interesting that you do, or mm -hmm. something like that, as mm -hmm. opposed, no, 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 here's what you're supposed to think, you know, because right. has Facebook ever changed your mind about anything? <laughs> <laughs> or Twitter, you know, it, it just kind of, hard, you know, it, what it tends it to do is locks you in, it gets right? us to calcify our mm -hmm. positions, mm -hmm. and then we learn techniques on how to outwit the other people, you know? Um, or just make fun of them when all else fails, you know? And you really Unfriend brought them, right? Uh, unfriend them, exactly. You really bring something 
that we try to talk about, that's what we talked about in the collusion diagram that we did for connecting with the peaceful heart, and the other one that we're going to be doing on power of curiosity. Get curious and be aware of ourselves. So when you feel that urge to unfriend the person, or you feel yourself getting congested inside around a conversation, that's the key to put our, tr our principles at work and to ask the question and to step forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have, a, I, I have a lot of ex-law enforcement friends on social media. Yes, you do. And they, um, yeah. They're, they are, if you, ha you want a fun time <laughs> on a Saturday night, drop into one of the long conversations on Jim's page. Uh, Between my new thought friends and my mm. ex-law enforcement friends. And one of them posted something yesterday um, that I haven't responded to, but he said, how can you possibly be a law enforcement officer and not want Donald Trump to be president? Because the last president went to cop killers' funerals, which is true, you know, and you can look at all the reasons behind that. But the, again, there's another statement that I disagree with that has an internal logic to it. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about how to engage that person who used to be my partner. Tell me more. You know, in terms of because it's not just oh you're full of crap. You know that doesn't work. And nor, 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 nor is that person full work, of crap. Right. No, they're not. They're well, they're not, not from right? their perspective, yeah. and, and it's not like they're stupid or anything like that. It's just from, the, from the, their life experience, their interpretation of the facts they receive, that makes sense. You see? And um, there are other people from the other side of the spectrum that are saying, wait a minute, you know, what Obama was trying to do was to kind of move the scale a little bit to be more even-handed in communities where there are people of color. And, um, yeah, that's true, too. You see, that's, in, that's internally consistent from that viewpoint. So how do we find a way to have a conversation about that rather than just throwing a bunch of facts at each other? Because, you know, my facts and your facts don't agree. Therefore, your facts must be fake news. <laughs> yeah. Or if they do agree, you're interpreting them wrong. What, what right? I'm hearing in the dialogue that's going on with yourself or on how do you respond to that person is, is a call to bravery and courage. And it's, yeah. it's to be willing. It's to be, to be willing to say... The, the tell me more question, to be willing to stand on principle and to know that it's okay that we don't necessarily agree. Yeah. But what's not okay is that we don't have a conversation. Yeah, I know if I met this person in, pl in, in uh, person, you know, we would probably sit down and have a beer or something and probably not talk about politics. Um, you know, or if we did, it would be kind of a, you know, because... There, there are massive differences in the world view, but it doesn't mean that we, we say cut each other out of our lives, you know, and, and we both walk away from the conversation online shaking our heads about what happened to this person, right? So we have to understand there's a, there, that's our commonality. Our commonality is a lack of understanding of how our differences arose and, and understanding what they are, but that doesn't mean we can't be civil to one another. Um, it just means that we're probably not going to agree. So if that's the case, how do we move forward as a larger body of people taking into account all these different worldviews? And I think the key is leadership that understands complexity, that understands all these different dynamics that are going on, and is able to, uh, to some degree, to speak to enough of them that there can be a somewhat of a consensus built. They're, again, the European form of government where you have the democratic s situation where it's parliamentarian, where there's like 15 parties, and whoever gets the most vote has to negotiate with other parties to, to get a ruling coalition. Lead, right? So, for example, in Germany, Angela Merkel had to negotiate with the farthest right-wing party because that was the only way she could get a governing coalition. So that meant her policies moved somewhat to the right, but theirs also moved somewhat to the left in order to reach that kind of goal. We don't, we don't have, there's no incentive for us to do that at any of our governmental levels because we tend to just harden our positions and make the voting gerrymandered so that mm -hmm. seats are safe for certain viewpoints, you know. There are now, I think, 20 states 
where in the congressional elections coming up in 2018, one party can lose the popular vote by more than 5% and still get the majority of seats. So hard to call that a democracy. Yeah. So, you know, so how do we work through that? How do we, you know, how do we in our system, and the courts are doing some of it, checks and balances in terms of making look at it, but, but they need to hear that there are people that are speaking up in a constructive way. That's, and that's key. Yeah. And that's, that's what was around, around the uh, email that I sent out with all the representatives' names. We have the ability to do that. Um, there are many elections where, in, in the congressional race, races and the state assembly races, where the winner wins by 100 votes or 200 votes or 1,000 votes. So a community like ours that, okay, we're not all on the same page, but we're in the same direction and having these understandings of where to go. We can make a big difference. And so as we get together and have more conversations and become uh, more courageous about stepping forward with the voices that we have, we can actually make and impact that kind of change mm -hmm. that you're talking about. And so that's, that's the next evolution of the science of mind teaching. This is what I talk about almost every week, is that this urge within us, this ultimate resplendent good that's emerging from us, is a desire to have a more collective, collaborative life experience. If we're looking at nature, if you do, a, if any of the gardeners out there, the best gardening is a companion garden where you have different things growing in the garden that support other things. Dominic, is that not right? That's how it works. You, you mix some <laughs> stuff up sometimes, <laughs> right? Not completely, but there, there's, there's some of that. Geography, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, can have that, so we can have that same kind of life experience as well. Yeah. And that's what we're calling for. Yeah. And the other, the other piece of this is that I try to focus on is don't go out into the world of social engagement until you're personally ready to do so. Wow, yeah. You know, or because we have so many people that best of intentions, they get all fired up and they go out and they're carrying a sign, you know, for peace and they're hitting people over the head with it that disagree <laughs> with it. <laughs> because it's so important that we have that kind of inner balance, that we have that inner emotional intelligence, that we have done the inner work to do, daily spiritual practice and taking classes and reading inspirational things and trying to incorporate all that into your system so that when you do get out there, you're a force for reason, you're a force for clarity, you're a force for justice, as opposed to just being somebody else standing and screaming at somebody else you know, behind a barrier. And that's so critical. You know, because you can do more harm than good, because what you do is you just, you just affirm what they already believe to be true about you. You know, one of the things about the Quakers, for example, the Quakers used to be very, very common. The Quakers were asked to go in and mediate legal things where they had intransigent sign sides in a court or something, and the judge would say, let's get a Quaker mediator to come in, because the Quakers were known to be fair and reasoned because of the nature of the way they practiced, practiced their faith. And I'm not saying that's our role, but I'm saying it, I think we, ideally, a good religious scientist is going to be seen as someone that's showing up with a compassionate heart. Mm -hmm. and, uh, can, can, and the compassionate heart includes the possibility that there are other people that have a, 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 a section of the truth as well and that we're there to uplift and not to tear down. You're making me think of uh, Yvette Flanders at the oh, okay. convention, who's the fundamentalist preacher who says, I'm, 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 a, I'm a Pentecostal, and she was very clear about it. But she's been hanging out with Ken Gordon and David Alexander, and she says, you guys are rocking my faith. And, and now she calls herself a Metacostal. Yeah. Because she understands that there a is something, be Pentecostal, there's something yeah. beyond the, the more traditional forms of, of faith. And that's, that's the step that we're on. We're, we're, we really have a wonderful opportunity, every person here who's in this room who is uh, familiar with this and comfortable with this teaching, and as Dr. Jim says, take the classes, read, come back each week and, and participate with each other, and we will find that those opportunities will come to us because we're going to be the attractors of that. And so when these conversations come up, they're coming to you on purpose. It's part of the universal expansion. It's part of the emerging of the intelligence of the universe to bring you in these conflicting, feeling conflicting conversations, but it's really your growth edge. It's the, it's, the, it's the universe patting you on the back and saying, job well done, you've done your work. Now, here's an opportunity. And it really comes back to that old phrase, I, I love this one, know thyself. Mm. If you know yourself, you'll be available to make that move. Yeah. 
you know, I'm, I'm sure that there are issues that are u not unique, but fairly prevalent in Simi Valley that may not be the case over the hill in Westlake, you know, and I don't know what they are. You're living here, I'm not. But there may be opportunities to engage and to, to assist and to uh, bring a new perspective to the possibilities. And that's, I think, what we should be doing, ideally, is, is learning the teaching here, embodying it as best we can, and going out and engaging our world in a positive way. And um, I don't think there's a better philosophy for these times than new thought. But we have to be rigorous in our practice and rigorous in our understanding for us to be, you know, used to, my, my third grade nun used to say, I want to be so prayed up that when I walk down the street, people are healed just by walking past me. Wow. Nice. So what's the new thought version of that, the equivalent? What's the mental equivalent of you being so clear and so connected and so awakened within yourself, so realized that just by showing up, you have a positive impact and you're able to access whatever inner wisdom to say what needs to be said in the way that it needs to be said or to do what needs to be done in the way it needs to be done. You know, and, and guess what? When you do that, the rest of your life works too. <laughs> Yeah, then you, know, you get all that other stuff, right? You know, people <laughs> say to me, how are you and Dorian able to do what you're doing? I say, well, we practice the science of mind. No, really. <laughs> <laughs> really. I'm serious about that. I can think of no other explanation that, would, that makes any sense to me. Is that we both take this teaching very seriously. We spent years doing our practice on a regular basis, doing it apart and together and that what we have manifested now is a direct result of that. It's a direct correspondence of that. So we continue to do that. And it's not that we don't have troubles or issues, it's that in general, everything's good. Our health is good, we have, we have enough wealth to do what we're doing, and we in, we, we've been so incredible to attract people into our lives that we can engage with and, and do what I think are valuable things to do and have a great time, eat great food, drink great wine, visit amazing places. They're not inconsistent. Well, you always have a place right here. Thank you. You know that, yeah. right? Thank you. <laughs> well, thank yeah, we, you. Could, we, could, we could go on all day, yeah, but we'll, we'll, we we'll stop. But I, I just want to close with, you know, as a student at Holmes Institute, I had this class and there was this guy and I, who's this Jim Lockhart guy? And to stand here with you now, after sitting in class going, wait, 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 I got that, I understand that, I understand that, oh, that's so awesome. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just such a special moment. And such a special moment for all of us to, I mean, you know, we got something really special here, mm -hmm. right? And the reason we have something special here is because every person in this room is special. And you know it. Look around at the people that are here. Really, look right now. Look around at the people that are here. There's something happening in this space. And yep. it really is up to us to take this happening out there every day. To be that person that's prayed up like his nun. Okay? And so it is. And so it is. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the workshop's going to start at 1. I'll get you home in time for the red carpet. And, um, and then if the books, I think there's maybe one, there's three total. I think a couple of them are gone, but they're on Amazon, either in Kindle or paperback, if you just want to look that up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. Mm -hmm. Time for our healing prayer. Loving the way we do prayer. Let's take our teaching out loud. Let's make this thing work for us the way it is living through and by means of us. So if you're feeling called in this moment, if there's something that's coming through you that says, ah, I know this is not the way it's supposed to be in the world, or I know this is the way it's supposed to be, and let's have more of it. If it is a person, a situation, whatever, I'd like for you to call that out into the room right now, and we'll use the collective spirit of the intelligence of the universe and move that through in prayer. So I call out now, please. Mm. 
settling into the understanding that there is one life. That life is God, and that life is the life of each and every person in this room. That life flows through the power of love and is activated through a law that says yes to our deepest intentions. Understanding that the words that we speak begin with a thought in mind. And so right now we align our thoughts to the principles that we hold dear. We know that there is peace, joy, love, harmony, right action, divine guidance, perfect resolution, peace, abundance, infinite possibilities, a universe that brings to it all that is necessary for the most joyous and fullest experience of life. This is what we teach. This is what we know. This is how we live. So as we speak our collective word for the various people in our lives that we know are moving through an experience that is only a stopping point on the way to a more full experience of life, we just right now acknowledge that the divine powers are making that real in their experience. That there is something moving right now with our thought into action, into realization, into what we call demonstration. And so as we feel that, Allow that sense of joy to arise up within you that is aligned with your faith and your conviction and the power that is working for us, through us, as us. And in the comfort of that knowing, allow that gratitude to become overflowing as we release these words, these ideas, these intentions in mind into a law that says yes. And we affirm that movement by saying, and so it is. David, got the baby.